Well, my little clock says 12 o'clock, and um, the world is run by people that show up on time. So uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. <clears throat> uh, it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to the Learning Collaborative Asthma COPD um, learning session for today. Um, attendance at this session is good for one hour of CME credit through the UVM um, College of Medicine. And um, uh, Tanya will display that uh, QR code, whatever, um, so that you can take a picture of the take a picture of the QR and and submit for your for your credit. Um, so. I, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Amy Yanachak from the Albany College of, College of Pharmacy. We met preliminarily about this presentation, it seems like over a year ago, I think it was over a year ago, and now the day has finally come. Um, Amy is a clinical ambulatory care pharmacist and diabetes educator at Richmond Family Medicine. Um, she precepts the Albany College of Pharmacy students in that setting, uh, as well as providing, uh, you know, clinical consultations for the for the physicians and others at that site. It's a, a very excellent model. Um, she is an educator, uh, assistant professor of pharmacy practice at the Albany College in uh, Colchester, and I was particularly impressed with her. Um, CV in terms of her pedigree, so to speak, coming from the University of South Carolina uh, for her pharmacy degree, and then going on to do a couple of uh, re pharmacy residencies uh, at uh, Providence St. Peter in Olympia, Washington. And I, what I know about Providence is that that health system is a, a heavy utilizer of, of clinical pharmacists in their clinical work, so she is well acquainted with that. And then another year with the family medicine program at the University of Washington in Seattle, a very excellent program. So uh, without further ado, uh, Amy, the, the podium is yours, and I think you're going to be sharing your screen. So thank you very much, and we'll be ready with lots of questions when the time comes. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Um, so hopefully everyone can see my slides. Um, it looks like we might have some people waiting in the lobby as well that might be coming in. Um, so we'll continue going from here. Um, please feel free to unmute yourselves if you have questions for me. Um, and I will take questions at the end as well. Um, so today we're going to talk about asthma and COPD. And as Norman Ward mentioned, um, I'm a pharmacist at Richmond Family Medicine, and I teach here at the college in Colchester. Um, I don't have anything to disclose today. Um, and so I work in family medicine, I'll say that. It, so I'm a jack of all trades, um, and I love that. So going from inhaler teaching to diabetes management to help with hypertension or heart failure to helping someone who brings in a basket of 25 meds for me to look through with them. And as my bio mentioned, I really have a love for helping patients learn about their medications, how to use them correctly, um, and then get them off the ones they don't need and help optimize the ones they do need. So when it comes to asthma and COPD, that's so important. As we know, you know, these inhalers, these tiny little inhalers cost hundreds of dollars. And so to make sure our patients are using them correctly is, is one of my top things that I make sure I do. Our objectives that match with what was in the, the sign up for today um, is we're going to talk about the medications. I'm going to talk a lot about inhaler use and the importance of, of doing that correctly. And I'll talk a little bit about how I navigate um, insurance and options for patients. So I'm going to do a quick knowledge check um, for those that are here. The way that my slides are displayed, um, I can't see the chat. Um, so feel free to answer these questions on your own and I'll present them at the end. So write down your answer to these next four questions and then you can compare at the end if you have the same answer or you changed your mind after I talk today. So the first one is talking about rescue inhalers and what might be the most appropriate 
rescue inhaler option for a 33-year-old patient with mild asthma who has symptoms two or three times a month. Um, this is a lot of what I do is choosing good therapies for our patients. And so some of the options are things like terbutaline, ProAir, uh, which you might know as, as that albuterol inhaler, Pulmacort um, and Venlin, um, or Simbacort um, as needed. So those are some options to think about here. So I'll have you write down your, your answer you're thinking of. If you like that participation of writing in the chat, you can always put your answer there too. I'm gonna go on to the next one. Um, talking about correct inhaler use, some of you might go over this with patients or if people call and ask. So what are some correct words to describe how to use some of these dry powder inhalers? I have a picture of one here, like an Advair inhaler. I have another one that I'm holding up. Um, the Ellipta inhalers or dry powder inhalers. So think about what words you would use to describe that and you can choose more than one here. All right, going on to the next question. Um, thinking about black box warnings, these are things that are added to medications that are higher risk. Um, it stands out that it's something someone needs to know when they're starting that medication. Um, so there is a medicine here that's used um, for asthma or COPD that had a black box warning added last year. And so just a, a check in to see if we know that and hopefully you will by the end of our talk today. And the last question, um, there's there's actually more than one triple therapy out there now, but there's one called Trelogy Ellipta um, that has different medications in it and just knowing which what that medication is used for. Um, as you guys can tell, I'm a pharmacist. I love talking about drugs. Um, so hopefully by the end of this, you'll just feel a little bit more comfortable talking through these medications um, in the setting that you work in as well. So first we're gonna talk about asthma. Um, and so asthma is a reversible airway disease. And actually when patients do spirometry or even have an exam, up to 35% will have a normal physical exam. So they might complain of certain symptoms like wheezing, shortness of breath, especially with allergens and certain triggers. But when they come to a doctor's office, they might present very normal if they're not having an exacerbation at that time. Um, we assess asthma by asking patients about symptom control um, as well as risk factors. Um, what's not asthma sometimes is what I think is a more important question. Um, so sometimes I have people that come in and say, I have this cough all the time. Maybe that could be due to even a medication. Um, they might have COPD, which we'll talk about. GERD or that acid reflux can actually present as asthma types of symptoms, bronchitis, uh, respiratory infections, and then the new thing, right, is, is even respiratory infections like COVID. Um, I've seen more um, albuterol inhalers like ProAir or Venlin prescribed this past year just for, for patients that um, have very mild asthma and so they wanted to make sure they had it just in case they got COVID. Um, or even for patients that um, were recovering from, from COVID. Um, and so things that we can look at as well are assessing those symptoms, um, such as nighttime awakening, um, how often they're having to use a rescue inhaler, and then things like risk factors. Um, so you're supposed to look at risk factors for asthma every one to two years. Those are things like even rhinitis, um, obesity, and air traffic pollution. Um, those were all things added last year that contribute as risk factors to developing asthma too. Um, so in this time of COVID, of course, I've got to have my COVID consideration slide. And so for any patient, um, you want to make sure you have a written asthma action plan. Um, and I'll take a, a pause here for a second, just as a reminder, um, to maybe have some of our One Care staff help me, you know, maybe mute anybody as well that needs help muting their microphones. Um, that being said, feel free to uh, eat your lunch <laughs> while we do this. Um, so with COVID considerations, avoiding nebulizer use, um, 
because that's going to put a mist into the air that'll be inhaled by the person using the nebulizer, but also is an open environment that someone's, you know, going to be breathing in around others. We want to try to avoid that right now. Um, we want to uh, avoid spirometry um, with someone who is suspected to have COVID because we don't want them coming in and doing certain exercises like having to forcefully breathe in or breathe out um, if we're trying to have them wear a mask and stay away from others. And then steroids have that risk versus benefit that you have to weigh. So steroids um, can be in an inhaler or taken orally. They increase risk for infections, um, but they also help um, with asthma symptoms. So we kind of have to we want to continue patients on their steroids right now during COVID times, but also understand that there is some some risk of increased infection with increased steroid use. So the big thing about um, inhalers for asthma is that everybody gets an ICS. And if you're wondering what that is, that's an inhaled corticosteroid. So everybody that has asthma, the recommendation now, even if it's very mild, is that they get an inhaled corticosteroid. Um, and so those are things like fluticasone or rometazone. Um, they help decrease inflammation in the airways. Um, it used to be that everybody got just a short-acting beta agonist, which is things like albuterol, venolin, Proair, um, and that was the go-to. But now um, the big change um, that has come about is that everyone should get a combo of um, inhaled corticosteroid inhaler um, along with their albuterol inhaler. So now they have two inhalers that they're going to use when they're having shortness of breath, wheezing, or you can do a combo inhaler. Um, this is an example I'm holding up right here. Simbacort would be a perfect example of that, and that would have that steroid in it and um, a beta agonist called famoterol. Um, and so that's a big change that happened in the last year, and a lot of practices are still trying to make this shift uh, of getting patients to not have that albuterol inhaler anymore, but actually have a combo one um, such as Simbacort, or they're going to have two inhalers that they'll use. They'll use their albuterol inhaler, and then they'll use their steroid inhaler um, right after if they're having asthma symptoms. Um, so if you look at the GINA um, guidance, that's what's used for asthma. Um, their recommendations just for asthma treatment, they have ones for adults and for kids. So I just have the adult one here today, um, but the kid one in there looks very similar. So this is the difference in that anyone who comes in, even if they're step one, which means they're pretty well controlled, um, they hardly even probably use their inhaler for their asthma, they should still be getting something like Simbacort to use as needed. Um, instead of just a venolin um, or albuterol or Proair inhaler. So this change is slowly happening. I don't expect it to happen overnight, but in the next few years, we're gonna see less and less people that are just having an albuterol inhaler with asthma and more that are gonna have something like Simbacort. As we go up in our treatment, you know, for, for any patient that you see that's just calling about symptoms that might be asthma, here's, a good tool to use, the circular um, diagram of assessing, adjusting, and reviewing response. So anyone that calls and says, I think I have asthma or I'm having asthma symptoms, we want to start with assessing um, and seeing if they're controlling their symptoms well. We could check their lung function. We could see if they have risk factors or comorbidities, and we could look at their technique if they already have an inhaler. Um, and asking them what their preferences are, what works for them. Then you're going to modify treatments. There's non-farm strategies too. I won't just talk about drugs. Um, so removing the allergen or irritant, things like that too. And then you're going to check in again, make sure they're doing better, um, which is so important right now when we have a little bit less patient contact sometimes. Um, so I apologize for a lot of acronyms here. Um, and I'm happy to, to answer questions about those as well. Um, but the big part of asthma treatment is a steroid, which is the ICS, um, and then beta agonists, which are short acting and long acting. And you use the long acting ones for people who have more symptoms, um, more exacerbations that you need to control. 
And then at the end, I'll talk about a few of the other options you'll see out there too. Um, there's really good evidence for this use of, of something like Simbacort, that budesonide fomoterol. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight that, that these studies have come out, the novel start and the practical um, that show that when patients um, are using these, there's a significant reduction in severe exacerbation for just using albuterol alone. Um, and they also found people who use a steroid daily, you know, that's helpful too, but this is the sweet spot, right? They're using Simbacort as needed. So they're getting less steroid exposure than if they were getting one every day. Um, but they're getting better control, less severe exacerbations um, versus just using albuterol. Um, they also looked at things like inflammatory markers, which is what we're looking for in asthma um, and reducing, uh, there's reduction in the risk of exacerbations with that as needed ICS promoterol. Um, and that was independent of even seeing those changes in inflammatory markers. So basically you don't need to see the inflammatory marker changes to know that this is still gonna be helpful. Um, some people are asking, you know, do we have to use just Simbacort? What are my other options? You can prescribe two separate inhalers. So you'd give a steroid inhaler, you'd give um, the albuterol inhaler separately. And they, they showed this with kids. Um, more recently too, and it was effective. So that's definitely an option. This is the same chart for kids. So I just wanted to show it's it's very similar um, to what I showed for adults as well. We might just consider something like Montelukast or Singulair um, down here in LTRA earlier, because it's, it's a tablet, it can be chewable. So for kids, that's a nice option instead of an inhaler. Um, for me as a pharmacist, I look at a few things. I look at first assessment of um, when a patient first comes in with asthma, um, and then I go from what do we do next? And so asking questions about symptoms and then deciding what we need to progress to. Um, there are separate charts for initial um, treatment, so where you start with an inhaler. I think this is one of my favorite ones. So they actually say, depending on where symptoms are at, here's where you start. And then from there, uh, once initial treatment is started, then you go back to that circle I showed you, you reassess, adjust, review, and you go step up or you step down. Um, my, my big soapbox is, let's step down when we can, right? So if patient's doing really well, they never ever you know, have exacerbations. Let's try going down on their steroid dose um, as well. So, you know, those steps are great to follow, especially if a patient's well controlled, it's very easy. Um, but if we're evaluating uncontrolled patients, then again, as I mentioned, we're gonna reevaluate. And the first thing I do is watch patients using their inhalers, make sure this is asthma and not something else. Um, and then we talk about managing risk factors like those non-farm interventions. Um, so as we progress here, we're gonna talk about going back to this chart. This is how you'll decide to step up or step down. Um, but I'm gonna start with assessing inhaler technique and that's something anyone can do. Even if you have like a family member or friend who is coming to you as someone who's in healthcare and says, you know, my inhaler doesn't feel like it's working or I'm having worse symptoms or things like that. Anyone can help someone else assess their inhaler technique. Um, and that's what I want to talk about today. This does come from observation, you know, working in family medicine for a few years now. And then I did a little mini study last year um, with about 30 patients at our practice with, with a student um, researcher where we looked at virtual inhaler teaching. So you're thinking, how do I do inhaler teaching right now? Um, the last thing I'm having patients do is come in, take their mask off, you know, and, and use an inhaler in front of me. Um, so virtual inhaler teaching is a great option. We did that and of all the patients we did it with, every single one of them had at least one thing we had to correct or modify or change that they weren't doing correctly. So it just goes to show some of these patients were like, oh, I've been using this inhaler forever. 
you know, I know how to use it. This is silly. Um, but we always found something and it was great to see by the end of that quick visit, they always were very appreciative and happy that they had that teaching. Um, I was doing some of this teaching in person prior to COVID as well um, and have a little bit of data from that, but just had to stop it um, in light of everything last year. So we have the same results that were starting to happen, you know, with um, with doing it in person too. So teaching is, is really important tool and it there's been so many times I've used it a also to we'll talk about if a certain inhaler isn't working for a patient and you see that um, then you might want to switch what inhaler they're using to something that's easier to use so that they actually get the drug they need. So we have metered dose inhalers um, that you can use with or without a spacer. They're also called HFAs. Um, there's Respimat inhalers that have a fine mist, kind of like a, a nebulizer. And there's ones that are breath actuated. Um, so you actually have to breathe in. So dry powder inhalers are breath actuated too. Some MDIs like Q-Bar is breath actuated. So the pressing down doesn't actually give the dose. You have to actually breathe in quickly to get the dose on some MDIs. And MDIs are meter dose inhalers. So I'm holding one up. Here's a picture of lots of them. These are the ones we know. So in the upper right corner, you have a picture of a canister that has a medication in it. Um, and then the holder, there's a valve that shows how many doses are left and the mouthpiece where the patient's gonna have a tight seal and breathe in to get their dose. So when I'm teaching patients on these, I wanna go over some important steps that, that you can go um, and use and bring back to your practice. So first thing is we're gonna remove the cap Look inside, make sure there's nothing in there. Hold the inhaler upright and shake well. Um, up and down, not side to side. You wanna shake up and down. Um, and telling patients they should do this again if they haven't used it you know, for over a week and go through priming another time. I equate it to kind of like when you're putting, um, sorry, there was some, some back noise there. Uh, when you are, um, you know, getting whipped cream ready, right? You got to shake up that, that aerosolized container to make sure you get your whipped cream out. So same thing, shaking up their inhaler, doing some test sprays three to four times till they see a fine mist. Um, and then um, they also want to, you want to go ahead and check and make sure it's not expired. There actually are doses left. I have some patients that'll say, well, I still see a mist, even though it says there's no doses left. Um, and that's because you can still see something, but they're not actually going to get any active medication if, it, if that dose counter is on zero. First thing they do is breathe in fully and gently um, away from the inhaler and they'll breathe back out. <sighs> then they'll put that mouthpiece on between their teeth, biting with a closed seal. And, um, and they'll breathe in deeply and slowly like this. <sighs> And at the same time, press down on the canister. Sometimes I'll even tell patients, press down and breathe in um, and try to start that breath in a millisecond before you press. So I want you guys to practice this really quick. Um, if your cameras are on or off, I promise I won't look. Um, so go ahead, pretend you have an inhaler in front of you. I want you to hold that fake inhaler in front of you. And I want you to try to press and breathe in at the same time. Then you'd hold your breath for five or 10 seconds and then let it out. Um, so I had you do that exercise because sometimes it's hard to get that coordinated effort just right. Um, and it's if it's someone's first time using an inhaler, it's kind of like, you know, rubbing your stomach and patting your head at the same time. You want to have them practice that coordinated effort of pressing down um, on the inhaler and breathing in with that deep, slow breath. Um, so then the rest of the steps, again, holding their breath for a long time, waiting 30 seconds to get that second puff if they need it. Um, those are pretty easy. Um, and then they'll replace the cap and they can, you know, clean it with a damp cloth. So when we use a spacer, it gets rid of that need for the coordinated effort that makes this kind of hard for some patients. So when they have that spacer on, there's a picture of one here and below, they can even keep the inhaler on the spacer and keep it in their purse when they're traveling that way. Um, 
They still want to shake the inhaler well before use, but they'll spray it into this canister um, and then they'll put the mouthpiece, you know, on their mouth with a tight seal, breathe in, um, still doing a nice deep breath if they can, hold their breath, breathe back out away from the inhaler and do it again. Um, talking with the pediatric pulmonologist about this, you know, she recommended six to 10 um, of those breaths from the spacer. So one thing I've noticed is some patients only use the spacer one time, um, one breath, they think they're done and there's still some active drug in there. So making sure that they do six to 10 breaths. Um, so this is great for kids because it's really hard to get kids to do that coordinated effort correctly. It's also great for all patients. So I recommend everyone get a spacer. Um, I'll, when we talk about insurance and formulary, we'll talk about prices as well. Um, so using these, I went over those steps with you, um, very similar to using without the spacer, except not having the coordinated effort and having to do six to 10 breaths in, then breathe away from the inhaler and do it again. Um, there's also some meter dose inhalers like Respimat. Um, and these are what I call fancier inhalers um, because they create this fine mist. Um, they're nice and easy to use. You don't need to have a forceful breath or take a lot of work to get the dose. They can be a little more expensive though. Um, so when patients are using these, they have to actually turn the base, um, open the cap, and then press this little button, so T-O-P, um, while they already have the inhaler, um, you know, the mouthpiece or with their mouth on it, then they'll press and release the dose and take a slow, deep breath. Hold their breath 10 seconds and replace the cap unless they need to do um, a second puff, which they may. There's air vents on the sides. They don't want to cover those. Um, and anyone who might have seen these before, there's this little canister that goes in the end that is really hard to get in. So working in a pharmacy, you know, I'll offer once the patient's paid for it to take it out of the box and help put the canister in for them because you usually have to slam it down on a table to get it in. Um, so for a patient that might be more frail, this could be really hard to do. So making sure that they're able um, to get that canister in forcefully enough when they get the inhaler to use the first time. Um, then you think of dry powder inhalers. I have a picture there of Spiriva hand inhaler, which is more for COPD patients. I have another one here, Elipta, that has lots of different ones. This is an Incruz Elipta, which is more for COPD, but they all look similar, just different colors. Um, because these have a dry powder, in the handy heller case, there's a capsule that you put in. Um, then you have to press these little buttons on the sides once the capsule's in there. Um, and that punctures the capsule so the powder comes out. And then with all these DPIs, patients have to hold it like this horizontally. I tell them, hold it like you're going to eat a hamburger. Um, and then they have to breathe in forcefully, uh, more quickly. Um, these are breath actuated, so it takes the force of their breath to get the dose. Um, and so these are not good for patients that have kind of a weaker inhalation um, pressure. So um, I have devices where I even make the students do it and they have to breathe in really forcefully and they can't even get into like the green or good zone sometimes um, that you have to be in to use these dry powder inhalers. So Think about a forceful breath and then times that by two or three, and that's probably how forceful it needs to be. I'll have you guys, you know, think about that now as it, we look at this one too. So with a lot of these, this one doesn't have a capsule, but when I, every time I open the inhaler, it's actually dispensing a dose that's ready to go. Um, so I find it's best to actually even dispense the dose with it flat, so it stays flat the whole time. Um, and then there's air vents on top that you don't want to block as well. Um, that powder is ready to go, dispense. The patient does a tight seal and they do a forceful, full deep breath. Um, so I want you guys to practice that now. Try to do the most forceful breath that you can. And again, probably even harder than that is how much a patient needs to do it. Um, because it's a dry powder in there, you know, there's no second dose to actuate, but I recommend after 30 seconds, patients put their mouth back on the mouthpiece and do one more forceful breath in, just in case there's any dry powder left. 
they make sure they got all of it, and then they close the inhaler and put it to the side. Um, dry powder inhalers are really popular, so MDIs and dry powder inhalers are the ones you're going to see a lot. Advair is a dry powder inhaler as well, um, and some of these are going to have combo of different medications in them. Um, so I went over one of them. The Advair is similar. It just has a little uh, lever on the side that you that you use to um, give the dose instead of the, the cap doing it, like it does on an Ellipta. Um, but so just so patients know, I just had a patient a month ago who got one of these inhalers, and they didn't know that every time you open the cap, it actually gives a dose or actuates one. So they kept opening and closing the cap over and over, and they used up, you know, all their doses. Um, without even you know, getting that medication. So um, a caveat of that is those things happen. Um, so this is kind of more of an insurance or, or cost issue, but you know that patient didn't mean to use it incorrectly, but they did. So we weren't able to fill it at the pharmacy because it wasn't time for the refill. But I called the manufacturer, explained to them what happened, and they sent a new inhaler to our practice right away, next day shipping, for the patient to get, and then the patient just came and picked it up. So no cost to the patient. Um, they had to send it to us because they it's not a prescription, so they had to send it to the practice. But that person then didn't have to wait a whole month to get their next inhaler. So a lot of these manufacturers are great about if you need an inhaler for a patient and they can't get one yet because their inhaler broke or had a, an issue, um, that you can call and, and get a replacement inhaler. Um, so we've talked about these Ellipta dry powder inhalers, um, so I'm not going to talk too much about those. Um, but I, I'm hoping you know you guys will get these slides shared with you as well, or I'll give you my contact info at the end if you'd like them. So last thing after we've gone over inhaler technique um, is assessing symptoms such as daytime or nighttime symptoms, how often they're using a rescue inhaler, like their Symbacort or their albuterol inhaler. And asking like about their activity level, what what exacerbates their symptoms? Um, are they able to be as active as they like? Um, there's two ways you can do this. So if you're trying to find quick um, questionnaires, the there's a rule of two. So you can say, have you had to use your quick relief inhaler or had symptoms more than two times this week? Do you wake at night more than two times this month? or do you refill your rescue inhaler more than two times per year? And if, if the answer to any of those is yes, then you probably need to assess if they're really being well controlled or not. Um, there's an asthma control test as well um, that provides a score that patients can use. So different tools that you can implement. And for those of you doing quality improvement projects, those could be good to add into your charting or documentation. Um, some pearls are, that different steroids um, are, are different equivalents. So I have a table I'm gonna share, but my go-to is you have to look this up and you're gonna titrate or increase that steroid dose um, for symptom management um, and how the patient responds. Um, beta agonists are the long-acting ones, so a long-acting version of albuterol, um, and those can all be different too. So they're not fully equivalent, um, so it does, go to looking at a low, medium, and high dose for each type of inhaler, and then deciding where you're going to start for someone. Um, so you can't just switch one to one from one to the other at times. Um, I mentioned Montelukast or Singular is the one that's a tablet. Um, there was a, an added black box warning, which I've got highlighted in this box here, um, about some risks of serious neuropsychiatric events, um, and especially in kids. Um, so it does include this suicidality note um, for adults and adolescents. Um, it caused some nightmares and behavioral problems in children. This is, a, again, a very small subset. So it's not a reason not to prescribe this medication, um, but it is a warning that you need to make sure someone's aware of, uh, make sure it's still the most appropriate option for them. Another new addition was this new Trelogy inhaler, um, three medications in one, um, was approved more recently for use in asthma. It always had been more of a COPD med. Um, 
And so I just note that because I even had a family member start on it recently. And I said, why were you on that? It was last year. I said, isn't that just for COPD? And then I looked at the evidence. Um, unfortunately, it didn't help with exacerbations in patients, which is kind of what we care about. But it did help with things that they measured like lung function. Um, and then this is a drug called Spiriva we always think about with COPD patients. Um, but there's some evidence that it, you might be able to add it on, just like in this triple inhaler, it has this in it too, um, for patients to help with exacerbations in, in some real world studies. So kind of at the end of the line, really uncontrolled asthma, we're gonna think about these last few options here and biologics. Um, this is a busy slide, don't worry about it. The point is it's busy, which means choosing a biologic takes a lot of work. Um, that would be a whole other conversation in itself. Um, but these are things that are like monoclonal antibodies um, and they work in different ways, different approval criteria. They'd probably have to see a pulmonologist or we'd have to work on a PA or getting that drug approved. Um, and they all work in different ways in, in this cascade of of different um, inflammatory mediators and helping with that. So for a patient that's not well controlled, the answer here is there are other options um, if, if typical things like inhalers aren't working. Um, one of the objectives was they wanted me to talk about how each type of drug class works. Um, not that I wouldn't love to do that, but I think it can be a bit much. So I have a slide here and I'll share these with anyone afterwards if you'd like to know more about how each medication works. Um, and some of its adverse effects so that um, or we can talk about it at the end as time allows. So then we get to our transition into COPD um, which won't take as long because we talked a lot about inhalers already. Um, so asthma and COPD do have some overlap. Um, so asthma we want to make sure we're never treating with bronchodilators alone. Again we're going to add that steroid on now. COPD, we're always going to start with longer acting uh, agents in most cases, um, and we don't want to go with an, a steroid um, in COPD patients right away. Um, patients who have both asthma and COPD are more likely to die or be hospitalized if they're treated with um, a long acting beta agonist versus something that does, uh, versus something with a steroid. So we actually want to add steroids for patients that have both. Um, and then high dose steroids might be needed for really bad asthma. But we really want to try to avoid those in COPD patients. Um, so COPD is different, right? So asthma, you know, there's this inflammatory um, response and stricture um, you, due to something, whereas COPD is this persistent respiratory symptom, likely from exposure to a certain type of particle. And in many cases, that can be um, tobacco um, or, or smoking cigarettes. Um, I've treated patients too where it was just exposure to like open cooking fires um, throughout their lifetime if they lived somewhere where that was the way that they traditionally cooked their food. Um, we can look at imaging and, and oxygen and lung volume, looking at spirometry like we do with asthma um, or even exercise testing. Um, but well, before we just say you have COPD, we want to make sure someone doesn't have uh, an infection like tuberculosis, which would be rare, but we want to check for that. Um, CHF is heart failure. So heart failure can present a lot of times like COPD, um, where they're having shortness of breath, trouble breathing, but that's due more to, to fluid in the, the chest cavity area or heart um, and around the heart than it is um, to do with breathing issues from COPD. Bronchiectasis um, or other things that affect the bronchioles um, might seem like COPD, but they're actually not. So we just want to make sure we think about those before we say someone definitely has COPD. Um, just as I showed you that circular um, diagram when we talked about asthma, COPD is kind of similar. As you can see, it's like there's a little more swirls in this circle, but we diagnose COPD based on symptoms and risk factors, just like with asthma. Um, we decide what their gold level is, which is looking at their forced expiratory volume, that FEV1, we won't worry too much about that. Um, we look at their symptoms, um, we look at their exacerbations, those are the top two things. And then we can also look at things like smoking status um, and certain things that apply to some patients. 
And the biggest thing is if smoking is a part of this picture, we do smoking cessation. And we had a great um, CE from this collaborative on smoking cessation specifically, I think about two months ago. So I won't get into that too much today, but that's a great um, you know, part of COPD management as well. Um, and then we can review, we're gonna see how they're doing, reassess a lot of the same things we do with asthma. Um, so COVID considerations um, to do with COPD, and I've taken a lot of these straight from GOLD, which is kind of our recommendation group for COPD, um, is to limit doing spirometry again, just like we mentioned with asthma, um, stick to the evidence-based risk reduction, um, maintain exercise, still do vaccines, see your provider regularly, um, continue meds um, and make sure patients are getting refills. They're not going without their COPD medications. Um, this just came straight from um, the American Thoracic Society thinking about COPD um, patients um, and then how they might present um, with COVID as well. And then things progressing all the way to acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, so the point here is one, Throughout a course of COVID in a COPD patient, we want to continue their COPD treatment. We don't want to stop it um, unless that's clinically indicated very late in the game. Um, we still want to make sure they're doing good protective strategies like wearing masks, um, of course, continuing their therapies. Um, and so just things to think about, and, and you can look at this more in the guidelines, but the, the point is continue their COPD treatment um, in, in almost all situations. So the big thing, as I mentioned for COPD, is everybody gets smoking cessation if, if smoking is a factor. Um, and we have lots of options like nicotine replacement therapy, some medications like bupropion or varenicline, which is Chantix. You have non-farm options like cognitive behavioral therapy and motivational interviewing. Um, and the top recommendation is to revisit this every time when you see someone with COPD, which, which is hard to do, especially when someone says every time, I'm not going to quit smoking. Um, but it, it's been shown that if you ask every time, eventually someone may say, yes, I'd like to talk about smoking cessation. So that's the key here, ask every time. Um, not everyone gets that steroid because we are worried about increased pneumonia risk. and um, a triple therapy with a steroid might be helpful. Um, it might even lessen someone's chance of death um, that's symptomatic with really frequent exacerbation. So it's something we consider for some people. Um, we think about macrolides, which are an antibiotic um, that also have anti-inflammatory properties. And those can reduce exacerbations, especially if taken for over a year um, in, in some patients. So that's an option too. Um, so when we're thinking about doing a steroid, stop and consider, you know, if some this red box here, if someone's had pneumonia or respiratory infections, um, or if they don't have a high bloody eosinophil count, that's a big part of it. Um, that's a marker of there's inflammation going on here. Um, so if there's not really a sign that this is an inflammatory process, then a steroid's probably not going to be as beneficial. Um, that's when you might consider, though, other other things um, that are mentioned, like reflumolast or those macrolides, too. Um, you might consider if they're showing some increased inflammatory markers, some higher eosinophils, and then maybe you will go on and use that steroid if they're having um, a lot of exacerbations. Um, they do show an inflammatory process, or maybe you suspect they have asthma, too. Um, Again, for the sake of this group, you know, the big takeaways here are looking at this as kind of a, a Y axis and an X axis um, along the bottom and side. We're looking at exacerbations on the Y axis here because our goal is to reduce exacerbations. Um, and then we're looking at these two scoring tools um, that look at symptoms, MMRC and CAT. And if you have more symptoms, you get a worse score, you're going to need more meds. Um, so a difference here is a lot of people need some type of bronchodilator. Um, 
usually starting with something like albuterol, but progressing more quickly to something long acting, because again, COPD isn't something that just comes and goes. They pretty much have it all the time. Um, so thinking about something long acting, that's what the LA is for. And then going on to think about things like Spiriva, um, which is quite common um, if they're having more exacerbations. And then we talked about when we think about steroids. Um, they have such great tools in the guidelines. Their charts really, I think, help explain what to choose next. So once you've assessed that they have COPD, you're going to think about what their lung function is like and then what medication works best based on symptoms and exacerbations. Um, so this orange box on the side, I just wanted to highlight that patients with almost daily symptoms, which is a lot of people, need something long acting. And then you should see if there's something inflammatory going on, like higher bloody eosinophils, maybe they will benefit from, from a steroid in that case. Look at that beautiful circle again, review, assess, adjust, just like with asthma. Um, and the difference here when we get to COPD is if they're really not doing well, we start to think about, is their issue more dyspnea or like difficulty breathing? Um, shortness of breath, or is it more they're having exacerbations that are sending them to the emergency room or to the hospital? So if they're having more exacerbations, the red chart over here indicates that we want to consider looking at eosinophil counts, thinking about a steroid, um, and then we have things like reflumolast or azithromycin, um, especially is helpful for people that are former smokers. If they're just having shortness of breath, then that's probably not our first go-to to think about those other options. And you might even just wanna see if they're using their inhalers correctly and every day. These were all the, the different drug options that are mentioned um, and that we talked about today. So reflumolast is our anti-inflammatory non-steroid. Um, we have those macrolides like azithromycin, there are things like mucoregulators that help with mucus. Um, and so not as much evidence for those. I didn't talk about them, but that could be a last line option. So going back to seeing a patient, if they're having exacerbations or dyspnea, you got to think about inhaler technique. Um, this was a study of COPD patients where they found that two thirds of them didn't use their inhalers correctly. Um, and this was at discharge for a COPD exacerbation at the hospital. Um, a lot of people sometimes even, if it says twice a day or two puffs, they'll only do half the dose they should because they're trying to help the inhaler last longer. Um, the biggest issue was something called low PIFR or low peak inspiratory flow rate. So they weren't breathing in um, with enough force, which is what I mentioned, right? So think about someone with COPD, they already have airway obstruction. They might even um, show signs of like bending over or, or having to work harder to push air in and out of the lungs. And now we're asking them to have this forceful, strong breath, which is so hard to do. And that's where you might need to change them to a Respimat inhaler or a nebulizer that's a lot easier and takes less force. So my key questions are, show me how you use it, look for the forceful inhalation. Are they taking it scheduled like all their other meds? Some patients sometimes forget or just take it when they remember. Um, are they trying to make it last too long because of cost? Um, and are they tracking benefits? Sometimes patients say like, I don't really think it's helping. So they could check their, um, you know, their symptoms at home and keep a log to see if it's actually helping too. So people ask me a lot about insurance coverage, um, and I apologize for going a few minutes over, but I think this will this will be important. We'll still have time for questions. Is that, um, you know, what do I do to help patients with cost of inhalers? So we have generic options more and more now for a lot of inhalers. When I think Advair, there's the there's now generic and the Wixella Hub um, is another slightly cheaper option of that. Um, we can advocate for a medication by doing something called a prior authorization with insurance. We can also do an appeal for someone's tier to be lowered. So if it's a tier three med, which is expensive, we can appeal to insurance to make it a tier two or a tier one med. Um, but we do sometimes have to show um, financial need in that case. 
If they're not on Medicare, then we can consider things like coupons um, for some patients too to help reduce cost. And they say that when you use an inhaler, you only get like 5% sometimes of the active drug. And when you use a spacer for ones that you can, you can get up to like 16% of active drugs. So a spacer is a great investment. Um, they can cost anywhere from 10 to 20, $25, and they'll last forever, right? They can use it over and over again with different inhalers and help them get more drugs, so better results. Um, I want to just point everyone to the DIVA website um, for, Medi for Medicaid or Green Mountain Care. And these are direct screenshots just to show you when you go there, you find the formulary and they update it sometimes almost every month. Um, so then you find what are preferred agents in each drug class, um, what are the ones that are not preferred, need a PA, and what's the criteria I need to show my patient, patient needs this. Um, so Brestree is the other like triple therapy you have to show they've tried different things before um, you could get that one covered. So I just go to the formulary. This one is from March 12th, um, so it's updated pretty often. And so I have to just go back and check because it can change multiple times during the year. So I just wanted to show the how things look so that you'll be able to identify this if you're going to the Diva website. Um, for Medicare, um, you can go to the Medicare website and look at drug plans for patients. Um, patients can choose or to change their Part D plan anytime between mid-October through December. Um, and so they go to the website, which is listed below. Um, they say they want to look at their drug plan or Part D, enter their zip code, um, and then they can put in all the drugs they take or would want to take, um, and then it'll prompt them. So if a patient's on Ventolin, it'll even say there's a lower cost version available. Do you want to try that? And you can say yes or no. Um, I usually, when I'm trying, I put a bunch of meds in all in the same drug class for a patient. Um, and then we get to, they choose a pharmacy and then it tells them what the cost will be, the cost before deductible, after coverage gap, etc. cetera. Um, no patient would be on all these meds. I was just showing you um, what I do sometimes putting in a lot of different medications to compare and see what's a good option. Um, so that's something to consider, um, especially if you're trying to figure out the best price for someone. Um, you can find out their plan, choose that on the website, um, choose the medications they're taking, and if one's really expensive, maybe you can try a different drug in that same class. Commercial insurances are going to have formularies that look similar usually to um, the Diva website. Some will have more of an option where you have to go to their website, put in the drug um, like we do with Medicare. Um, so in summary, patients um, that have asthma are going to need a steroid as needed. Um, COP patients don't need a steroid, um, but they do need that repeat smoking cessation offering. Um, and we do want to consider, you know, um, extra things during COVID, still check inhaler technique, even if it's over the phone or ideally a video visit. Um, I do have these review questions and for the sake of time, I'll give you all um, the answers here. So our first one is we're going to think about Simbacort um, as needed for a patient who has mild asthma symptoms now. When we think about correct inhaler use with a dry powder inhaler, it needs to be forceful and deep quick to get that powder into their lungs and breath actuated so it's all them doing the work to get the drug. We think about a black box warning. Um, so which medication has a black box warning added? Um, you can compare what your answer was originally to what you think it is now. Um, and the answer is C, the Montelukast. And then triple therapy of Ellipta, um, as I went over, is actually now used for both asthma and COPD. So I do want to take some time for questions. Um, before I stop sharing, um, you can read this nice cartoon. And I also want to share some really great resources I like. So I talked about Gina and Gold. They have pocket guides um, for asthma and COPD. There's a website called inhalersforyou.org. So save that. 
Um, you can print out instructions for patients. They have videos. Um, and then for me, I just, this is more for anyone in the audience that is more interested in like up and coming, you know, drug studies or looking at the evidence more closely. Um, I form our access where I go um, as an ambulatory care pharmacist for a lot of good information. Um, so I will stop sharing here. Um, get back to you guys. Um, and take some questions. Amy, that was terrific. Thank you so much. There are some questions here in the okay. um, in the chat. Um, maybe starting at the bottom and working up, Dr. Okay. Eckhouse, Dr. Eckhouse says uh, the, I guess, presuming <laughs> around the prior I can read it, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so thanks for that question, um, Dr. Eckhouse. I think uh, it is so frustrating not knowing what's covered. Um, and just like it is for you, it is um, hard for me to help patients with this too. You know, if it helps your staff to have printed out versions of some of these more common formularies like DIVA, you could have it printed out so it's just easier for everyone to look at um, in the office. Um, as far as prior auths, um, you know, I think I found that we can usually get something approved if they've tried, you know, the other first line options as well. Um, so close follow up with the patient, seeing if those first line ones worked for them. Um, and then, you know, not being afraid to advocate for peer to peer, um, you know, the, mo the more time intensive things, unfortunately for me, sometimes it's also just writing that strongly worded letter of support um, and having to, you know, for lack of a better word, bother, right, the insurance company um, is what needs to happen to get the right medication for a patient. Um, so those are my best options at this time, you know, um, without getting into it too much, we can talk after too. Um, someone said freezing a spacer, do you still recommend four to six times? So for when you're using a spacer, yes, you want to go ahead and take a, a breath in from, from that spacer chamber. Um, then they'll hold their breath for ideally up to 10 seconds, take their mouth away from the inhaler, breathe out, go back to the spacer um, and do that breath again. Um, so they need to do that multiple times to make sure they're getting all of the drug from the spacer. Um, someone said, do you see a difference in costs for life-saving medicines in other chronic diseases compared to asthma? Um, I find that asthma medications are some of the most expensive, and I think it's because of some patented like inhaler delivery devices and things like that that are a part of wrapped up in that cost. Um, so I think we need more researchers to actually just look at cheaper delivery options as well as, you know, the drug itself. Um, someone said also, I'm not a clinician uh, regarding asthma given the number of individuals that might present normal combined with the tendency for those with asthma to subconsciously adapt, is it possible that step down may be counterintuitive? Um, so, you know, my, my big thing about step down is we're not gonna do it without follow-up. So if we ask someone to go down on, an, on a steroid dose or they're gonna go from using an inhaler daily to just using one as needed, we're gonna follow up probably within a month um, to make sure that that was the right decision for symptom management, because um, that's what you're looking for in asthma. So if you do that step down and their symptoms come back, then you go right back. But I, I think that's better than keeping them on more medication than they might need for the rest of their life. Um, and then <laughs> it says, like, it seems like Medicare Part D plans are a bit quirky. <laughs> Um, there's a lot, there are quite a few Medicare Part D plans. Um, so I recommend, you know, if you have, um, you know, I, I love social workers are great for sitting down with patients and looking at the Part D plans and going through all the meds. I can be helpful to provide to the social worker a list of all the meds in the same class. So if a patient says, my inhaler is really expensive, what can I do? I can give them a list of other meds in the same drug class, and we could see if Medicare Part D covers a different one um, in that class that's cheaper. 
you can actually, if you're not sure if things are in the same class, that DIVA list is really helpful, right? Because it lists them by drug class. Um, whereas as you saw on the Medicare website, they don't. So having that DIVA list could help you even navigating the, the Medicare website. All right, I'll stop talking now. Any other questions? <laughs> Amy, this is Norm. The um, the instructional videos that were mentioned on some of your slides are those on the um, inhalers for you website? Is that where you got? Um, they're from different places. I'd have to go back and see um, exactly where the link goes to. Mm -hmm. But I like the inhalers for you site. Um, and then again, uh, let me know if everyone's been provided the slides, or again, people can contact me. My email is. Amy um, dot Janicek at ACPHS dot edu, um, or if you contact um, someone from today, I'm sure they can help um, get them to you as well. I could type my email in the chat actually. Yeah, I was I was trying to see if I, I mean, I have a copy of your PowerPoint. I was just trying to see whether the links were actually active on the slides and they I, should be. Yeah. Um, yeah, I am. Um, yeah, they don't they don't seem to be. Uh, maybe there's a way of sending the deck um, in a different format or something. Maybe uh, Tanya can help with that. But OK, <clears throat> thank you so very much. Um, we're going to officially break. It's one o'clock. Um, the collaborative groups are going to stay on the call here. And uh, 